So if you will, if you have your Bibles with you, open up to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. This is just going to be a springboard verse, and then we're going to get into several things uh, tonight. I pray to be a blessing and an encouragement and hopefully a help to you. That's what we're here for, is that to be that, to be all those things. And uh, so looking forward uh, to tonight. So Ephesians chapter number 5. I'll explain the verse more towards the end. But I want to put this verse in your mind and let you hear it. And then we'll get into the message. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 15 in particular. The Bible says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. The Bible says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days of are evil. You know, I want to look at the thought tonight of watch out. The title of the message is watch out. It could be a trap. Watch out. It could be a trap. You know, I I was thinking about that and, and in our life there are many pitfalls. We see all kinds of things all around us. There are things that are that are uh, pressing us, and say, "What? What is?" Most of us know what a trap is. Something to to capture something or to catch something. But I wanted to go a little bit deeper into what what it could be meaning in uh, in in type of a uh, application sense, more so uh, in applying it with that of scripture. But trap means that of a trick by which someone is misled into acting contrary to their intentions or interests. Let me read that again. It is a trick by which someone is misled into acting contrary to their intentions or interests. You know, and and that's what we say. What are traps? What are they? They're they're disguised well. They seem right. Uh, You know, we sometimes we go into things with the best intentions. Uh, one, of the, one of the verses that really applies to this is Proverbs uh, chapter number 14, verse number 12, that says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, we all think things are, are right. We, you know, and, and you go into Judges where it says that every man did that which was right, what? In his own eyes. And we see society, we see things, and, and everybody has that mindset that everything is done. Uh, you know, we have the mindset of, of what we think is right and wrong. But the Bible is our God. Not society, not everything else. The Bible is our God for right and wrong. It's like what people say, so, well, I'm not sure. I'm here to tell you, if the Bible says it's right, then it's right. The Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong. There's no question, there's no gray area, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And this, this is what we, th- what we think, though. And, and tonight, I want to share with you three areas and types of traps. I'm going to show you some positives in it, and, and there's the negative part of it, but then how to over- overcome it. And I want to show you, show you that tonight. You know, uh, a lot of times, though, when we see that, you know, well, we think it's okay, it's not going to hurt anyone. You know, and, and the thing is, all of these are easy to fall into, although we don't see it sometimes. I'll go ahead and tell you what the three are. One, the first one I'm going I'm to speak about tonight is the trap of influence. A trap of influence. The second one tonight is the trap of favoritism. And then the last one is a trap of comparison. I want to show you these three. The Lord gave me these. I was driving to work, and they just, they just came to me as soon as I got... Got to the office, ran out. Brother Terry, I ran to my desk and wrote, wrote the outline down real quick. Because you know how it is. I mean, I'm getting older and I forget things. I, and, and believe me, I wrote it down. And I'm sitting here having this go through my mind and go through my mind. And you know what? I forgot the outline four times. As I was trying. I had it written down on a piece of paper sitting right there on my desk. And I forgot it as it, as it was going through my head. So finally, I, I, I put this together. But I want to share with you tonight, looking at... Uh, number one tonight, influence. Influence. You know, how are we being influenced? You know, is there there's a positive, of course, a positive influence, a negative influence. How are we also, how are we being an influence? Are we being a positive or that of a negative influence? One of the things I share with you, that of be careful of the company you keep. The Bible tells us very clearly in Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You know, you got, we are, you know the old adage, you're judged by the company you keep. 
You may not be that one. You may not be the one, but those who you run with and those who who you hang or hang around with. And the thing is, is that people have a way uh, of fooling others and and have a way of of influencing others. Even I'm here to tell you, even the wisest of Christians. You know, you think we're not beyond falling into this. We're not beyond because the thing is, is people are just some people are just so likable. I mean, they are. I, mean, I had a real good friend. I still have a real good friend. I don't, so don't use that in the past tense. He and I are still real good friends. But for several years, he was an atheist. But you know what? He was so much fun to be around. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't vile. He wasn't vulgar or nothing like that. He's just fun. He's a funny guy. And, and I loved hanging around him. But you know what? Since then, the Lord's worked in his life. And he's, and he's moved. You know, and, and he and I have had many great conversations. And, and you know, I see the Lord moving in this man's life. And it thrills me to know that. And we still stay in contact, uh, even to this day. But, you know, uh, think about uh, things about how we're influenced in Exodus. You don't believe even the wisest of, of, of uh, people who are involved in that of Christianity can be fooled. Exodus, go and read on, on your time, Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 6. Go and read that. Moses and Joshua are up on the mountain. You know, Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments. And, and then Joshua is there uh, on the mountaintop, you know, praying. And, and, and neither one of them are there. So accountability has gone. So they're, they're up on the mountain. And you know what's going on? All the Israelites are getting all paranoid. They're like, where are they? Where's Moses? God promised us all these things. Where is he? Where is he? And he said, we need gods we can worship. And the man of God, instead of standing up and being the man of God, you know what he says? Bring me your earrings. Bring me your gold. Bring me all that. We're going to dip it. And he dips it in and he melds it and he makes it a golden calf. He says, all right, here's your God. Let's worship. And this is the man of God. So don't think influence can't. People say, well, I can, I can get around him. I can influence him. I can be better. Watch out. Because even the best can be influenced. Even the, even the wisest. We must be careful. We must not fall into that. Then, uh, you know, we, we must be uh, cautious in, in looking at our influence. Of course, that not only us, but also our children and that of our friends. we got to look, look at all that. Second Samuel chapter 13. You can read this one on your own time too. This, one, this one's a sad story. Second Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. We get to the story of Amnon. Many of you know, know your Bibles, you know who Amnon was, that of the son of David. Of course, that of uh, his brother was Absalom, of course, his sister Tamar, and then their, their, their cousin, first cousin, Jonadab. They're standing there talking, and, and, and Amnon's having these wrong thoughts about his sister. He's wanting to have a relationship with his sister. That's sick thinking in and of itself. I love my sisters, but I tell you, uh-uh, uh-uh. You know, and and you know, and then Tamar is is there, and then Jonadab says, "Well, you know what? Go ahead." He goes, "Here's what you do," and they schemed a plan. And here's a man who was the 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 son of the king of Israel, falling for this. And it says, you know, and, and it's like he said, "You deserve." And the Bible says, "But Amnon had a friend." So I've got to be careful of those. Go back to Proverbs 1.10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You know, he, he had that wrong influence. And what happened there? James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. I see it clearly here. It says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away. And you've got to read this verse very closely. It says, when he is drawn away of his own lusts. Not other, not other things, but of his own. So you're drawn away by something you're drawn to. Something that you, and it says you are drawn to your own lust and enticeth. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we see that. And it says, it, then, then you think about that influence, Samson and Delilah. That's the one that always comes to mind there. See, and it, here's where I tell you to be cautious. You know, and, and some of this is going to go into, in, into family and in, in, into marriages. You've got to be careful about those who you hang around, those who you talk. You think about Samson. Samson here is hanging around Delilah, and he keeps telling her and telling her things and telling her she wants to know the source of his strength. She wants to know it, and he keeps beating around the bush. He says, if you do this or if you do that or you do this, but then he finally, the Bible tells us, then he told her all his heart and told him, the strength is in my hair. 
Granted, the strength came from God, but that was part of it because God told him not to let the razor come upon his head. And she cut his head, and you saw what happened to him. That influence caused the downfall of a great man of God. Why? Because he allowed those things to get in there. We've got to be careful about those influences. And then, you know, of course, in that of our, in that of our marriages and those of our, those of our families, you know, family can be bad influences in there. Uh, you know, and, and one thing, and I give you this advice, if you are married and you are having, you know, things and you want to talk to somebody about it, let me warn you, first and foremost, do not, if you are single, do not... Exclamation point, exclamation point. Do not seek counsel from a single person. That's like me going to financial advice for somebody who's broke. <laughs> Go, you know, I mean, it's just you don't do that. You know, it's like, because what are they going to tell you? They don't know what it's like. They've never been. That is the, what, wrong influence. That is the wrong way you could fall into that because then you could get in that mindset. You get in that mindset think, well, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. You know, but we've got to be, you know, and, and, and here I'm talking about all these negative influences. But let's, let's talk about something positive. Jude, verse number 22 said, some having compassion, making a difference. Have that positive influence in somebody's life. Be that one that somebody can look up to. Be that one that, that you don't, don't, you can go because you've been down the road. Paul said in Philippians, he said, I'm going through this. So you can learn from what I've been through. You know, and that's, that's the things we go through in our life. There are things that you and I have been through. There's things I've been through I can share with you. One thing I, I, I tell you I've learned to say and I've learned this. Like somebody may be going through something similar to me. I don't know how you feel. I've learned, you know, I don't know how you feel. I've been down that road. I know the feelings I had. I know what you're dealing with. But I don't truly know how you feel about it. But I try to be that positive influence. Try to be that, you know, person. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. You can go a little bit further down. It says, be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's that mean? What does that mean, be filled? It means being controlled. You know what alcohol does when people get under the influence of alcohol? You know what it does. It controls you. You get what we like to call, uh, in, uh, of course, out. Uh, out in the world, you know what they call it? They call it liquid courage because somebody's being controlled by something. But we need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's what he does. He controls us. He controls our actions. He controls how we act. He controls our, our speech. we got to be yielded to him. You know, be that God. Be that positive influence. We need to be a Paul to a Timothy. We need to be a Barnabas to a John Mark. You know, we need to be those. You know, think about Paul. Paul had his reasons for getting rid of John Mark. He's like, you know, he left us. You know, I don't want him with us. You know, he's, he's done. But Barnabas like, hey, let me take him. I got it. I got him. And then if you read in Timothy, 2 Timothy, very end, he said, bring, bring Mark. Bring John Mark because he's profitable. You know, it's because somebody took an interest. Somebody took an interest in him and, and lifted him up. I remember growing up, I remember when I was younger, I was about uh, eight, I think it was eight or nine years old. And uh, I shared with you before in, in, uh, when I shared my testimony the other night that my parents had split up when I was about nine or ten years old. There was a gentleman who I still talk to even to this day. He, he was like a dad to me growing up. He took an interest in me when I was about nine years old. He could tell I was hurting, and he became a friend. He became a father figure to me. Uh, not that, not trying to replace my dad, but he was just there at times. He was, he was the one. I, I tell you, when I got out of line, which was rare, right, Terry? And um, I mean, you know, it's like <laughs> Dad lived in Atlanta, so he was like five hours away. You know, so Mom pick up the phone and call this fella. It's like he, he's out of sorts. You need to come get him. <laughs> so, but he would come and he would come and talk to me. And he would just be that positive role model in my life. And that I needed at that time. You know, he didn't, he didn't fall into those things. He was that of a friend when I needed it. And secondly, if you, if you fall into that trap of influence, you know what you then could fall into? It rolls into the trap of favoritism. Favoritism. I say, well, what is that? Eight times, the Bible tells us, eight times to not be a respecter of persons. I find it eight times as I was doing 
doing my study, which leads to that. You know, and, and that's what it is, is that you know, what, what people do is they play off one another. You, know, you play off that favoritism. You, you, you see that one, you know, and it's in parents, children, you know, friends, you name it. You know, what, whatever it may be. You know, it's like you, know, you have a favorite. You know, parent, kids may have a fa- favorite parent. They shouldn't. Parents shouldn't have a favorite child. They shouldn't. You ever read you ever read the story of Isaac and Rebecca? See what favorite children will do to you? I mean, you read that story, you'll see it. Isaac, Isaac, of course, had his favorite, which was Esau, and that of Rebecca was that of Jacob. And of course, they played off one another. And she she would she would hear what, what Isaac was planning with Esau, and then she would go and tell Jacob. I mean, they were, I mean, you know, the, the, the relationship between Rebecca and Jacob was stronger than the relationship between Rebecca and Isaac. And folks, that is a problem. The relationship between Isaac and Rebecca should have been the stronger of the relationships. And that way, you know, the old saying is like you, you, you ask them, you know, you say, well, you go ask, you ask, ask your mom something. And they say, go ask your daddy. Or so vice versa, you know, say, so go ask that. What would your mother say? You know, and it's like, it's funny, I hear people say, what would your mama say? Well, she said, no, then why are you coming to me? You know, it's the thing, you try, what do they do? Try to play one off, off the other. Look for that favorite, look for that, look for that favoritism, you know. And, and we saw that James talks about in James chapter 2, about that person who walks into the church, and they look good. They're all dressed up, it says they're wearing goodly apparel, they look great. You know, and then right behind them comes somebody in vile apparel. They're all vile, basically meaning dirty. They're not. They're not clean. Not not saying they're a wicked person. Just saying that their clothes aren't clean. And that. And but then you got the you got the one that looks good. And you say, hey, come on down here. The one that looks good. Say, hey, give you the seat of prominence. God's saying you don't do that. You know what? We're all equal. That's the way I look at it. We're all equal. We all got blood flowing through our veins. We all come from the same Creator. We all, we all hurt, we all bleed, we all, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I've seen it, and, I, and, I, and it makes perfect sense. When it's all said and done, we all going to be six feet under. And we're all equal. I mean, that's the thing, it doesn't matter. Might not be equal all the way through life, but you know what? We're equal at that point. And that's what we need to realize, you know, and you see that, see that favoritism and, and, you know, we're not to have that respect of persons in the workplace, whether, you know, we see it all over that, that, but we need to realize is that salvation is free to all. God doesn't play favorites. It's, it's free to all. The Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He gave us all a chance. It was all that opportunity. And, you know, I, I am so grateful for that. You know, and, and you read about how he extended grace to us. And what a blessing that was. He didn't play favorites. Yeah, he loved Israel, no doubt about it. But you know what? He loved us too. And he reached out and to us. But the last thing I want to look at tonight, and this is the, this is the main one, is comparison. You go, this, this is the worst one to be in right here, folks. Comparison. Say, well, well, comparison what? Okay, me looking at somebody else. Now I say, well, Philippians tells us that, you know, we should look on the things of others. So don't look just only on your things, look on the things of others. Let me interpret that one first. It doesn't mean material things. It means look out for each other. It's saying look out for the interests. So it's like it's saying, saying we need to look out for one another. To make sure one another doesn't trip up. Make sure that one another doesn't mess up. That's what it's talking about there. It's not looking on the things of others. But you know this right here, the comparison, is the biggest and I would say by far the best weapon that the devil uses. This is the one that really, you know, what does it do? It gets you focused on something other than what you need to be focused on. It gets you, uh, how does it do that? Well, there's a little thing called social media. Yeah, I'm on it. A lot of us are on it. I mean, we, we do. And, and you know, what, what does it do? Well, we see what others are doing. We see where they're going. We see what they're wearing. We see what vacations they're taking. Oh, soul, help us. We see what they're eating. And that gets old. Somebody posted food. I was like, I don't want to see what you're eating. I don't even care. 
And most of the time, I don't even like what they're eating. So, you know, so I can just scroll right on past. But, you know, and we see all those things. And, you know, what happens is the, is, is the devil gets in our head then and gives us a distorted view, does he not? He gets in our heads and he says, all right, look, look what they're doing. Why can't you do that? You could be doing that. You could be going on that trip. You could be wearing those clothes. You could be buying that car. You could be doing all these things. And all of a sudden, you start feeling like a failure. You start feeling like, man, where did I move? My, my kids are terrible. You know, I'm, I'm a terrible husband. I'm all this. I'm just horrible. Look at this. But God ain't told you that. Nobody's told you that. You are telling yourself that. You know, we keep our eyes, you know, when we do that and keep our eyes and thoughts on the things of others, it leads to a place of discontentment. And it doesn't need to. You know, and all this, all this uh, you know, falls into play. All this rolls together. Influence, favoritism, comparison. Influence could fall into comparison. Because you, because you could have people influencing you and say, well, you know what, you can go do that. You go do that. Go do that. It doesn't matter. I remember, I remember when we were looking to buy our, buy our first house. We were renting a house. It was about 1994. And we went and talked to a realtor. And they said, well, you can afford this much. I said, yeah, if I don't want running water, electricity, food. I said, if all I want is a house, yeah, I can afford it. I said, no, no, thank you, but no thank you. You know, but what does the world say? Do it. A buddy of mine talked about he was, he was out working. He worked for, actually worked for, worked for Duke Power, and he was going around, and he, was working, and he said that he would drive around, he, he'd see stuff at the lake, and he'd, and he'd see all these lake houses, these gigantic million-dollar houses. And he'd look inside, and you know how much furniture he'd see? Zero. House is empty because all they could afford was a house. They couldn't afford to furnish it. They couldn't afford anything else. They just had, so what do you got? Oh, I got a house out on Lake Norman. Well, good. But there's nothing in it. How do you enjoy things? How do you live? You know, and that's, that's what the, this is. You know. And the Bible tells you, know, I want to ask you this. Who are we trying to please? The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 1, verse number 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or if I, you know, if I, do I seek to please men? I'm not seeking to please God. And you know, that's the thing. I don't, I'm not in this to, to, you know, sure, I want you to appreciate what I do. I'm sure I, I want you to get something from it. But you know what? At the end of the day, as long as God's happy, that's all that matters. You know, and that's the way I, I, I look at it is that, you know, it doesn't really matter. What somebody else thinks. You know, it's like, well, so and so don't like you. So, he's not the first, won't be the last. That's the way I look at it. Is that's, that's just the way people are. But, you know, we, we, we go into this, and, and we need to remember this before we start getting into the comparison game and start falling into that trap. One thing we need to remember, folks, we're all, we are all made the same by the same. We are all created in God's image, but you know what? We're all different in a certain way. You think about this, some of us get up and we preach. You know, I Sean, Jamie, Robert, myself, we get up and we preach. Clint, this Sunday, got up here and sang. I, I enjoy hearing Clint sing. He talked to me one day after service. He said, man, I, know, I don't know how y'all do that, get up there. He was, I just get so nervous getting in front of people. And I said, you think I don't? I said, you look out there and see all those people? I said, I get nervous too. I don't know how they're going to react. I don't know these things. I said, but what you're doing scares me a whole lot more than what I'm doing. I said, well, you get up there and sing. I said, my soul. I said, I just can't do it. But you know what? God has given us all different talents. The Bible tells us in that of Romans chapter number 12, you know, that we all have uh, different things. We all have different callings. We all have different, you know, so we're not to sit around here and compare things. We're not to sit around here and just do that. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are many members, the Bible tells, of one body, and we don't have the same function. I mean, you think, what does it go in to say? It said, what if everything was the eye? Where's the hearing? If everything was the mouth, where's the seeing? Everything works together. We all need to be together. We all need to have that one-on-one -on -one and, and to be everything we can be. You know, and, and I believe wholeheartedly this is the absolute worst one that you can fall into. And one of the, one of the, one of the folks I listen to, uh, a podcast daily, they, they brought this up. They made this comment. They said, you know, they call them peace pirates is what they called them. They said they go out and they try to steal all the joy in your life. 
And they said, this is a peace pirate. That have fallen into that comparison. What, what is basically comparison equal to? Jealousy. That's what it boils down to. It's like comparison, jealousy. And, and you know, we've got to be careful about that. We see these things. We see, uh, you know, we, we, as I mentioned, uh, that of all these other things. Proverbs chapter number 6 verse 34 says this, that jealousy, and I'm paraphrasing here, jealousy is the rage of man. And it is. You think about it. Somebody gets jealous over what they see. They get jealous over what somebody has. And, you know, it's like people get jealous over somebody's job. They get jealous over uh, somebody's kid is going to the NFL. And mine's not. I tell you, I'll give you a good example. When I got jealous one time, I mean, I really did. Rick, I got real jealous one time. I went off to college. It was my freshman year of college, 1990. So I'm there, me and some buddies, we collected baseball cards and all kinds of stuff. You know, This young man, his name was Todd Van Poppel, 18 years old, same as me. I opened up a pack of baseball cards, and there's his pitcher with the Oakland A's, and he's a pitcher. So I go looking in Sports Illustrated and all this stuff. That boy, I tell you what, he was two days older than me and making $950,000 a year. And here I am in college. I said, man, I made a big mistake. I said, I should have learned how to play baseball. But, you know, I got a little jealous there at the moment. I said, how is that possible? So he, he's the same as me. You know, but, you know, what happened to him, I have no idea. I don't know what happened to him. I have no idea. But, you know, it's, the way I look at it is, is that, you know, we don't need to, uh, to compare things. You want to destroy a marriage quicker than anything? Start comparing. Start comparing your, your start comparing, uh, men, start comparing your wife to somebody else. See how hard you get slapped one time. You know, not that I've ever done that. I'm not stupid. But, you know, guys, you know, guys do that. Women, you know, think about that. Well, you know what? You used to have a, you used to have that six-pack ab. Now look at you. Now you got, yeah, now you got a keg. <laughs> you got that six pack, it's just hidden now. It's just well camouflaged. But you know, it's like, you know, it's like pointing and jabbing, you know. It's like, why, you know and one of the worst things, why can't you be more like that one? Why can't you be more like him? Why can't you be more? God, folks, that's just the wrong way to go. Don't, don't do that. Never do that. No, the comparison game don't work. And it's not a good thing. It, it leads you down the wrong road. It leads you down a wrong path. You think about uh, what happened with David. You think about David and Saul. David had just defeated Goliath. And you know, and what did they do? They said the maidens were out dancing and all. And Saul had killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. All David had done was kill a big giant. And he killed his ten thousands. But Saul, what did it do? Got in his head. Started getting jealous. Started getting angry. I got to plot to kill this boy. So I'm going to kill him. Why? Because he was jealous. So if I can kill him, he won't take the throne. If I kill him, well, I don't have to worry about this anymore. And he, got, and he got jealous. And then those comparisons. Of course, then Solomon, Samson, Demas, for example. Paul said, Demas hath left me, having, you know, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, he started comparing. You know, you think about it, he started saying, What am I missing? You know, you think you start comparison, you start thinking, what am I missing? Where am I missing out? Where where is something going wrong? You know, and the Bible tells us as you think about it, when you start hearing those things, you start hearing those voices. First John chapter four tells us to try the spirits. Because not everything's of God. There's things that's always in our ear. There's people that's always in our ear. There's things that we're always hearing. And that's that's what that's why we gotta tune it out. The comparison game, you know, and, and, and here's what I look at, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I think about that. You know, we need to focus on what we have and nurture what we have. And that's the thing, you know, it would be great, you know, the thing, when we focus on what we got, we don't worry about all this other stuff. Because all this, you know what all this other stuff is? Stuff. You can do without it. I can do without it. I, the older I get, the more I can do, do without stuff. And you know, one verse comes to mind always, and I and I and I love this verse. 
it's the Lord talking, and him and Peter are out walking on the on the beach. Peter starts talking to him, and the Lord looks at him and says, Peter, do you love me? He says, you know I love you, Lord. He says, Peter, do you love me? He says, you know I love you, Lord. And you go to the end there, he's like, you can tell the Lord probably exasperated, just kind of looks at him, do you even like me? Kind of what it was getting at, do you even like me, Peter? Lord, you know I do. He said, then go, feed my sheep. It was feed my lambs, feed my lambs, then it was feed my sheep. And then he sees his old brother John sitting, standing over there. He said, but what about him? What about John? And Jesus, and he said, he said, well, what if he tarries till I come back? And Peter, I can see Peter just looking at him. He looks at Peter, and I'm going to put it in today's vernacular. What's it to you? I mean, that's basically what he said. He said, what is that to thee? And put it in today's vernacular is what's it to you? And that's what, it, that's what we need to get in that mindset. You know, it's like if I say, you know, Pastor Sean's taller than me. He can jump higher than me. Well, what's it to me? It doesn't matter. I saw him Monday night. He had his knees wrapped up just like me. <laughs> saw him hobbling in there. I said, man, so he's just like me now, so I'm not worried about it. Now, I told him, he, if he ever asked me about my knee again, I'm, I'm going to hit him. Because he asked me one day, we, we was having a talk, and he said, Matt, how's your knee doing? I hadn't asked you in a while. I was always doing great. The very next day, I was hobbling. I, could, I was like, man, I said, you ever asked me that again? So, But you know, and that's, that's the Lord, you know, saying, what is it to you? Well, they got a nicer house. What's it to you? They got a nicer car. What's it to you? Doesn't matter. God's blessed you. You know what God says? God says, he said, I'll bless who I want to bless. Show mercy who I want to show mercy. This, you know, his ways, Isaiah 55, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It doesn't matter. You know, that's the thing we, we say, is it ever, ever wrong to question? No, it's not ever wrong to question. It's not ever wrong to ever ask a question. Jesus asked why. Look in the scriptures. It's wrong to question God. Well, then Jesus was wrong. What did he say on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he also, you know, when he was praying, Lord, let this cup pass from me. If there, and you know what he said? If there's another way, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The Lord settled, you know, it was the thing, you know, so there's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, why, why did this happen? Why, did, why is this going on? There's nothing wrong with asking. But you know what? Sometimes you may not like that answer. But as I said, you know, all these things run together. Everything, influence, what are we doing? Comparison, favoritism, all this runs. This is a trap, folks. And it can damage many a relationship. It can harm many a relationship, friends, family, marriages, anything. It can damage these things. Let's go back to the verse I was talking about. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 15 says... See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. What does circumspectly mean? This is where I want to bring it all together. Circumspectly means this. Carefully considering all circumstances and possible outcomes. Carefully considering all circumstances and possible outcomes. So when we think about that and all that's in our head and we wonder, we start thinking about that. One of the things, I'll share this with you before I close. Listen, I listen to a lot of, a lot of marriage uh, podcasts and a lot of stuff. Some of it's just hysterical. You just hear, man, I do that too. And you just find it funny. But they were talking about wedding rings one day. And they said, what, what, they said you know, we, they talk about the importance of wearing one. And they said, the one thing about wearing it is, they said, when you look down, number one, it reminds you. They said, but then at number two, it reminds you that every decision you make affects them. And I said, that's so true. Every decision you make, everything you do, everywhere you go, every person you come in contact with, it could affect them somewhere down the road. So that's why I started thinking about that, walking walking circumspectly. Started thinking about my influence on folks. Started thinking, do I play favorites? Have I ever done that? Yeah. I don't know why. I have. Try not to. 
But you know, that's, that's the thing. But uh, over the years, I've gotten to where I, I can be friends with anybody. I, I never met, I don't meet strangers anymore. I, I, I mean, I remember when I worked at Comscope, we'd go through Walmart and I'd see people I used to I work with. And we'd be leaving and the kids would just look at me and say, oh my goodness. I said, do you know everybody? I said, well, I know a lot of people. But that's the thing, you know, be friendly. What does the Bible tell us? And I was teaching this in junior church on Sunday. I was, I was teaching them about friendship and what, what real friendship is. And I said one thing, and I had them list. I was asking them, I said, what, what does it take to be a real friend? They're like, loyalty, kindness. They start all this great stuff. And I said, but what else? And they, and they were getting, they were so close. And I said, how about being friendly? The Bible tells us that for a man to have friends, he must show himself friendly. You got to be, you know, nobody wants to go hang around somebody got a scowl on their face all day long. I mean, you don't. I knew a guy, I worked for a guy, I mean, my soul, they asked him, I said, how can anybody be grumpy 365 days a year? I saw that man smile one time. His daughter brought his grandson in there and he smiled. So I figured that, so grandchildren are the light of the, light, or the, that light that lights up a room. So I have figured that out now. But it was like, that's the only time, I said, man, he does have teeth. You know, this is great. This is wild. But you know, this is what I wanted to share with you tonight. Think about, you know, walking circumspectly, considering everything in all your dealings with everyone, every relationship, each and every day. Pastor.